12 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Um, kind of the roll call. Chairman Lennon? Here. Councilor Guvenali? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor Wall? Here. Thank you. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, town Council reports and correspondence. Jim? Chairman Lennon, um, Friday evening that uh, the <coughs> Rotary Club of South Portland and Cape Elizabeth uh, had a very spirited evening to celebrate their 50th anniversary. And um, Sarah, you and your husband Paul uh, was, were uh, guests of the Rotary, as well as uh, Kathy Ray, who is a member of the Rotary, along with Mike McGovern, who is uh, a very uh, important person in the local Rotary, as well as Rotary International. Um, this particular evening was uh, Surrounded with the good food and friends and a lot of good conversation around the good work of the Rotary here in South Portland and Cape Elizabeth. And um, the <coughs> guest speaker for the evening was Ron Burton, who is the Rotary International elect president for the year 2014. So we're very pleased to have somebody of that stature in the Rotary uh, come to uh, South Portland and Cape Elizabeth and help celebrate this 50th anniversary. Um, that evening was also marked by another significant event, and that is um, uh, Penny Jordan, as we all know, was one of our uh, contemporaries up here as a town councilor and also a very active member here in our community in the farm industry. She was honored on behalf of the local Rotary South Portland and Cape Elizabeth with the Paul Harris Award, which is named after the founder of the Rotary. And uh, it was very... Uh, um, it was really, we're really proud to have someone uh, from Cape Elizabeth receive that award. Um, and uh, I was pleased, along with Sarah and Paul and Kathy Ray and Mike, to be there, along with my wife, Kathy, to uh, help celebrate the event. But uh, the final point I'd make is, Michael, thank you for the invitation. Welcome. And any time you'd like to host us to a free dinner, I'd be more than happy to attend. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Anyone else? Okay, um, now is the opportunity for citizens to come forward to comment or discuss on any item that's not on tonight's agenda. So if the item is on tonight's agenda, you'll have an opportunity before we take up the item. But anyone who's here to talk about something entirely different, please feel free to come forward. Seeing none, uh, town manager's report. I'll bypass this evening. Okay, great. Um, so our first item is number 55, 2012, and we're going to open that. This is, has to do with the Riverside Cemetery Master Plan update, and we're going to open that with a public hearing. And I see Jesse Timberlake is here in the audience. She's the chair of the Riverside Cemetery Committee. Uh, Jesse, do you want to come up and just say a few quick words about what, what's proposed? And Excuse me, Chair. Yeah. Oh, uh, we want to, we hadn't. We hadn't been approved the minutes from last week. Oh, sorry. We could do that quickly without sending Jesse. I back. can wait. Sorry. Okay. Skip so that move. one. Go ahead. <laughs> I move that we approve the minutes of the March 12, 2012 meeting. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you, David. Sure thing. Okay. Um, the Riverside Memorial Trustees, Beverly Brooking, Jerry Sherry, and myself, along with Deborah Lane, who did Yo Yeoman's work for us, and Councilor Govanali have worked for about a year updating the Riverside Cemetery Master Plan. Um, the original plan was done in 1993 by the firm of Moore and Saradin, who did a wonderful job, and so we had them come back again. Um, in addition, Bob Malley, Dave Jones, and Mike McGovern helped with our planning. <laughs> um, in the new master plan, which I'm sure you've seen, there are several improvements that we've recommended, such as control of the invasive plants and improved views of uh, Spurwink Marsh, Marsh, buffering of the maintenance shed, and, and most likely we'll be doing that not with fencing but with some sort of planting, additional tree plantings in the open area of the cemetery, and additional buffering along Route 77. Um, well, that would include the, the completion 
um, the continuation and the completion of the stone wall. And that would be at a cost of 45000 which we expect to obtain or hope to obtain from the general fund. Um, in addition, the trustees are recommending a fee increase for both the burials and the lots, and those recommended increases are in the agenda for this evening. So that's the basis of where we are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, opening it up to a public hearing, is there anyone here who would like to comment on the um, proposals for the um, master plan update, improvements essentially to the cemetery? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and open it to council discussion. Do I have a motion? Frank? Motion to approve as presented, along with the, um, along with the uh, schedule that increases in fees. Could you speak into the microphone, please? Let's do it one at a time. Okay. Um, I move to um, approve the master plan update for Riverside Cemetery and to assign $45,000 from the general fund to complete the stone wall along uh, Route 77. Seconded. Oops. Discussion. Jessica? Yes, I'd, I'd just like to say that I still have the same sentiments when we, as I did with our workshop. I think this plan is very well done and shows, I think, um, very appropriate and excellent foresight, and I, I, I'm very much uh, wanting to support it. Other discussion, Dave? Uh, I echo Jessica's comments, and I understand there's, we have another member from the Board of Trustees here with us tonight, and I'm sorry I've forgotten your name, uh, but I, we do appreciate Beverly. Th thank you uh, uh, for coming out tonight again and to coming for our, to our workshop. We really appreciate the work you've put into this. Jim? Sarah, and just a final point to echo the same sentiments, but also to uh, thank Frank, Frank Ovenelli as our liaison to that group because I think that uh, that connectivity between the council and the work of the Riverside Cemetery Committee is, a, I think, a, another valuable step in, in making sure that we're communicated with in appropriate, uh, appropriate ways so that we, we've got a heads up as to what's happening. And I'm very pleased with this, uh, this plan as well, and um, I will vote in favor of it. Only thing I'll add is that it's been a very dedicated group to work with. Uh, David Jones has also been participating in the conversations. Um, and it's been an um, interesting exercise and an uh, informative exercise for me to work with this group. Great. I would echo what everyone said. I think it's a, it's a great plan, and uh, I commend everyone for coming up with the proper solutions that are frugal and yet uh, necessary. So if there's no other discussion, all those in favor? Seven to zero. Uh, item 56, 2012, the Riverside Cemetery fees, which are related. Is there a motion? Frank, do you want to? I'll move that we, um, the proposed Riverside Memorial Cemetery fees, as presented in our agenda, be adopted by the council with the schedule that's outlined, out, outlined in the agenda as well. <laughs> I'll second the motion. <laughs> Discussion? Frank? Only comment I'll make is that the, the fees that were, um, that were adopted here or, or recommended here are intended to bring um, the fees in Cape Elizabeth closer to what is um, um, charged in other surrounding communities, so still um, uh, very reasonable relative to our surrounding communities. Jim? Sarah, just a question for Michael. Uh, have these fees been incorporated in the budget that is in front of us? Uh, through you, uh, not specifically. Uh, the, the cemetery, as we discussed earlier, is operating at, at a loss, and this will help to make up that loss. Uh, it, we're, we're hoping these revenues come in. The thing about cemeteries is you really can't predict income uh, mm -hmm. too accurately. I, I do note, too, that the, the recommendation in the schedule per the motion is to be effective September 1, 2012. So, you know, we hope incrementally this will help the cemetery budget. Uh, but it, it's not enough in the long term as long as interest rates stay low to really uh, make it substantial impact on the budget. Okay, thank you. Other comments? Uh, okay, all those in favor? Seven, nothing. <coughs> Item 57, 2012. This is the Fort Williams Park 2012 group use 
requests, people who would like to use the fort um, over the summer. Uh, and we have in our packet a list of those people with proposals that give dates and details and so forth. Uh, it's the Beach to Beacon on August 4th, with the setup beginning July 31st. The Engine One Labor Day Weekend Art Show begins September 2nd. Family Fun Day, June 16th. Uh, and the Cape Elizabeth graduation June 10th with rehearsals beginning June 6th. And finally, the Cape Elizabeth Little League, um, hoping for field use uh, from April through July as in past years. Is there a motion? Dave? Uh, I move that we approve the group use request set forth in our materials tonight. Seconded. Discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Uh, item 58, 2012, the Fort Williams Park Master Plan Review Process. Um, we uh, have before us a rather comprehensive and excellent um, report of all the proposals that of possible um, improvements to Fort Williams done by the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. Um, so, Jim, do you want to make a motion and just say a little bit about the work that went into it and what's proposed well this as you know that this was a um, one of the objectives for the council and um, the commission went about the process and uh, hired uh, the uh, john mitchell associates group to work with them to put together the update to the master plan this is one of uh, many of the things we are working on with the park to uh, to make sure that we keep things current a uh, lot of activity by the commission a uh, lot of public uh, hearings, not a lot of participation in, in some ways, but, uh, but certainly ample opportunity to weigh in. There was also a survey done which uh, gave us some clear indication of where people felt things ought to go. In the process, we, um, we moved it to the planning board that held a couple of meetings, a uh, workshop session that I happened to be at, and um, they spent uh, some, some significant time discussing all the elements and um, again presenting it back to us to then bring it to a public hearing for, uh, for another opportunity for the public to weigh in. Um, I think it's a pretty, um, it's a very robust um, schedule, but one that is, um, is needed as we plan and prioritize the work that will be done over the next several, several years. The one good thing that has happened in the Ford is that we have been able to generate income that now reaches close to what, 150 to 170 thousand dollars, and the commission is going to use this master plan to prioritize and determine where they spend those dollars. So it's all part of an overall strategy that I think is very good for the community and good for this park which is uh, considered a tremendous asset here um, by the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. So I move that we um, move the Fort Williams Advisory Commission and um, master plan review process that has come through the planning board now to a public hearing scheduled for Monday, May 14th at 7 p.m. Second. Discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Unanimous. Uh, item 59, 2012, additional lease for building 326 at Fort Williams Park. <coughs> this is a request to um, lease another 640 square feet for a chiro chiropractic office at building 326 at Fort Williams Park. Um, is there a motion? Uh, I move that we um, accept the lease for building 326 at Fort Williams Park uh, to uh, Carol Monroe for 640 square feet for a chiropractic office within building 326. Again, uh, just another highlight, this is another one of those strategies that's coming forward in building on the revenue streams from the park that are going to become eventually part of uh, continuing to invest in the infrastructure. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? Mike? I, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Jim Walter's <coughs> comments for a minute. Uh, Greg Marles gave me a list today of, of the different leases that we now have. And we lease out building 324, which is the smaller 
of the two offices row buildings at Fort Williams. We built this, this building, uh, 326, is the larger of the two offices row buildings at, at Fort Williams. We rent out the front house down at the community center at, 300, at 343 Ocean House Road that with the, the Edward Jones office and other related offices. We rent space to the Cape Courier uh, here in this building. Uh, and if you, and also, uh, Greg also tells me today, he's worked out another lease of a single room uh, at the community, at the building in front of the community center. Uh, it's, just, it's just a single small room for $3,000 a year to an outfit called Stroudwater Boat Works, LLC. It's an office for a gentleman who uh, makes uh, boats, uh, who has people that work for him that makes boats. And but if you add all of those together, the income is now about $75,000 a year, uh, in, in addition to one that's also coming to you next month for uh, where someone had an option of some space. And then if you add to that the short-term rental income we have for different uses, it's, it's about another 50000 including the Beach to Beacon fees, the, the picnic shelter fees. So it's about $125,000 a year now that we are receiving in rental income uh, for those different buildings. And that's the highest it's ever been despite the uh, recession and uh, is a credit to Greg working with the different parties. So the Stroudwater Boat Works one wasn't on tonight's agenda. He doesn't want to rent it right away. Uh, so I, I would ask the, the council's indulgence if you'd like to add that to the item so that we can begin to collect that income. It's so the I standard would, lease language that we, that we have. Uh, and it would be a two-year lease, 3,000 the first year and 3,300 the second year. So I would amend my uh, motion then to recommend the authorization of this town manager to sign a lease for Carol Monroe for 640 square feet for at building 326 and for Stroudwater Boatworks, a two-year lease for, what's the address? Uh, at 343 Ocean House Road. 343 Ocean House Road. And I'll second that amendment. Any further discussion? Yeah. Question, Mike. The, uh, so the smaller building on uh, Officers Row is completely rented now? The smaller building has been completely rented for some time to the administrative offices of Family Crisis. And the larger services. building, how much more space is available there? The larger building, uh, the, the second party, there's one small space left that someone has an option on. Uh, we will have that option on the uh, May Town Council agenda. Uh -huh. uh, to be exercised, and at that point, that building's fully rented. That's great. And all of the space that we've offered for rent at that point will be fully rented. Not to mention that having renters in that building helps them maintain it better it than an empty building, so that's really good. Great. Yeah, thanks to Greg Marles, too. Yeah. Pass great. along our thank you. Do that. Any other discussion, comments? All those in favor? Okay. Um, Item 60-2012, this is the gun club safety letter. Um, I gather that some folks are here to speak about this. I just want to note before I open this up, because there is our rules allow for 15 minutes of public discussion before uh, an agenda item. I just want to say that the purpose of it tonight is, is to consider um, um, that we refer this to the town council for a workshop. Um, a letter that we received from Councillor James Wagner expressing some concern about the safety issues, and a letter we also received from Mr. Mark Mayen. Mayen? Yes. Um, thank you. Um, in response to that. So that is, so essentially all we're doing tonight is considering um, passing it along to a workshop. So with that being said, um, I guess I'll open it up to the citizen, any citizens who would like to speak. Or should I begin with the two people who wrote the letter? Maybe, maybe we ought to start with the two people who wrote the letter so we have a little background and information. Um, Jamie, do you want to begin? Sure. Thank you. And then we'll have Mr. Mayen come up. Good evening, council members, citizens. Um, I was retained about a year ago to first um, look into this issue about the gun club and safety issues. And I started out by contacting uh, Mike McGovern and uh, Captain Sinclair and, and Chief Williams of the Cape Lewis Police. And the concern is that there's been some errant bullets 
that have ended up in Cross Hill. And as we all know, Cross Hill and Wells in that area has a high density of people and a lot of children. So there's some concern about the safety of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth uh, with stray bullets actually hitting some houses in one incident uh, hitting a house beneath the window of a child's bedroom. Uh, there was another incident as well of a bullet in the, uh, on a property in Cross Hill. These are documented in the police files for, uh, for uh, the council to see. And my client is concerned about the safety of its own family. I've spoken with multiple families that are similarly concerned. And I think the town needs to consider its own liability uh, with regards to the public safety of its citizens. Uh, this isn't just a Cross Hill issue. Um, there was a study done over a decade ago concerning the distance that a bullet could travel from the gun club. And it surprised me when I first saw it, but theoretically, depending on the type of gun, a bullet could travel all the way from the range over to Shore Road. Uh, so I guess that makes it a beach to beacon issue as well. Um, this is not an anti-sportsman's issue. It's not an anti-gun issue. We're not trying to close the, the club down. It's a safety issue. And we have no problem with safe use of guns, but I think everybody can agree that there should not be careless use of guns. The uh, other issue while the town is considering the gun club, given its vintage, is considering environmental issues as well. Um, I've done some pre preliminary research on soil issues and contamination. Uh, I think more work is merited. Um, recently, the gun club has made it clear that they have some interest in changing their use which may include uh, gun competitions. Uh, there was an article in the Press Herald, December 31st of 2011, or 10, 2011, uh, regarding one of the members who's recently decided not to renew his membership because of, it was, it was a disagreement of whether or not everyone should have to become a member of the NRA that's in the club. Putting that issue to the side, um, it did quote uh, officers in the gun club saying that they were interested in pursuing junior, junior gun club uh, membership and competitions. So the, uh, my understanding of state statute is that the current noise uh, issue is not something that the citizens can object to in a private nuisance lawsuit, but that if there's a change in use in the current use of a gun club, that there can be some consideration about what that change of use is and what the town, whether or not the town needs to have further regulations regarding that. So I think it merits further investigation into what the actual use is, uh, the intended use for the future use of the gun club and to see whether or not that's something that the town should further have some input on. Um, again, I was retained to look into this issue slightly over a year ago, and I appreciated the input that Mr. McGovern gave me and that, the, that uh, Captain Sinclair and Chief Williams gave me, uh, and I did contact the gun club, and I did have a single meeting with uh, the attorney for the gun club. But after that first meeting, I had multiple inquiries that I sent out to the gun club, all of which went on unresponded to. So at, at some point, my client said, you, you contacting these people? And I, I, I made one further attempt, and then I came to the council. So uh, I've read uh, Mr. Mr. Mann's response and I believe you all have it, so it speaks for itself. Um, I wouldn't characterize it as conciliatory. Um, 
and I don't think he's really addressed what I'm talking about. Uh, I know that he takes the position that my client's interested in shutting down the gun club, and I'll tell you that's just straight wrong. That's not the intent here. It's about safety, and I think that we all should be able to have a, a robust conversation about safety and that it merits it. So with that, I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Mr. Mann, would you like to come up and speak? Good evening, councillors. Uh, my name is Mark Mayone. I'm the president of the Spurwink Brown and Gun Club. Mark, do you want to move the mic up a little? Great, thank you. You'll have to excuse me. <clears throat> I'm not that great of a public speaker, so I apologize for my nervousness. Um, I'd like to start by saying that Spring Run and Gun Club has been a, a uh, member of the South Portland, or the, excuse me, Cape Elizabeth uh, community for the last 57 years. And through that time, safety has been paramount to our club. Uh, many of our members work and live here in Cape Elizabeth, and um, we believe that we have been very good neighbors. Um, we're simply trying to provide a safe place for our members to exercise their Second Amendment rights and to enjoy themselves in, what they, in their pleasure in shooting. Um, I, I have to disagree with, um, with Jamie Wagner's uh, uh, belief that uh, his client doesn't want to close us down. This is really, in our opinion, is where this will is trying to go. And um, we obviously don't want that. And we have shown uh, that, uh, as you've all read the letter, that we have done many things in our club recently, within the last few years, to address any safety issues, whether real or perceived. Um, we've spent uh, untold thousands of dollars just within the last year to uh, ensure that we have a member-specific ID for everyone coming down onto the range. So if there are any issues, we can address those issues at the club. Um, we've, spent, uh, we've spent a large sum of money on surveillance for our club. Um, as far as... Uh, I'm just reiterating things that are in your letter, uh, that the letter that I've sent to you. But um, I believe that uh, as far as trying to work things out with uh, Mr. Wagner, our club is uh, definitely willing to sit down in a workshop environment and uh, see what we can come up with. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any citizens who would like to come forward and speak? Okay, seeing none. Oh, I'm sorry. Hear me? Hi, Ben Black, uh, former Cape Elizabeth resident, uh, still a member of Spurwink Rod and Gun. Uh, just wanted to make a quick comment. I used to live here. My kids went to school here in the Cape schools. They also went out to that Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. They learned to shoot. Uh, more important, perhaps, than shooting, they learned safe gun handling. Uh, they're safe around any kind of firearm, which is worth a lot to me. I don't get down there much. Most of you guys probably don't barely recognize me anymore. But uh, there's been a long history there. I'd say, like, when I was living here, it was the late 80s, early 90s. It was no problem. Somewhere around the beginning of the 90s, uh, people come in, and all of a sudden, they didn't want that rifle range there. They used to start sprinkling nails in the parking lot so you get flat tires. They go so far as to prop a nail up against your tire, so as you pulled out, you'd get a flat tire. And there was at least one incident where somebody pulled a phony deal with a bullet, said it struck their house, and it was an unfired round. That's the history. And uh, 
as far as I know, people down there are trying pretty hard to keep things safe. And uh, I'd sure hate to see anything happen to that place. That's it. Thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Mark Membrino, and uh, I just wanted to make sure to comment on that. Uh, my house actually was struck by a bullet, and I can assure you I, I didn't plant it. I, I did find the bullet there, and I had the police come and remove it. Um, and, you know, I, it wasn't planted, I can assure you. I can you out. tell us your address? I, um, I'm on one Cardinal Lane, which is just off of Cross Hill Road. So if you look at it, um, you know, like on Google Maps, they kind of, they aim, you know, right at me. But I mean, obviously there's stuff in between, I understand, but there is, the range does aim towards my house. Um, and we did find a bullet in the side of my house. Thank you. <clears throat> Just to follow up with Mr. Membrino's statement, the police report that covered that incident stated that it was their belief that the bullet came from the gun club. Thanks. May I ask a question? I don't know who the proper person to answer, but um, the gentleman who spoke before referred to it as a rifle club, and I wonder if the kind of firearms that are, that are used now are different or the same, and whether that has generated, you talked about a sort of a sea change starting in the 90s when people became much more intolerant and so forth. And I, I myself have heard many complaints about the noise and it and it seems it does seem louder to me than the 10 years I moved in here so I'm just curious is it was it once a rifle range and is it now using different weapons or, or is there an do you know the answer to that uh, I'm sure Mr. Mayon has a better answer than I do but my understanding is it's not limited to rifles you have multiple types of guns but I defer to him The type of uh, firearms that are used at the club really have not uh, changed in their caliber or sizes over the years. Essentially, those have always been the same. Um, in regards to the gentleman whose, whose house was um, struck with a, a errant round, I can only say that um, although the police may believe that the round was from our, our club, uh, as you've seen in the letter, uh, that is by no means a, um, an indictment that that is our, or this is in no means a way of showing that that club, that round came from our club. Um, but please, I, I don't, and I don't want to sound cavalier about this, is our club, and this comes up at every single meeting, safety is number one in our club. Um, this is why we've spent so much time, and I can't even count, I can't tally the amount of man hours that we have spent addressing safety down on the club, trying to make us safe. Every year we improve. Every year we continue to improve. And from this moment forward, every day that we go forward is a new day that someone is coming up with an idea to make us a safer club. And that's all generated from us. We're just trying to exist there. We are just trying to be good neighbors there. We've, we've shown that we've done good neighborly things. We've, we've amended our shooting hours. We've increased the amount of money that we spend down on the range. So I, I, I don't want anyone to think that we're just being complacent down there, that we're just trying to, we've been there so long and that we just feel entitled. Um, we don't. We work on this. We work on it continually. Um, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Michael Westcott, longtime member of the Spurring Rock and Gun Club and a current secretary. I've uh, been there for many, many years, but uh, the term new use of our range with junior shooting, 
I don't believe we can fall under that because our bylaws state that we have to support junior shooting and junior sportsmanship and conservation. And that is our primary goal is to support conservation and the future of shooting sports and fishing sports in the state. And so uh, if, whether, if you were to say that it's bringing in youth groups to compete with other schools it has always been a position of our club. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to council discussion. Do I have a motion? Dave? Uh, I would move that we refer the topic of the uh, gun safety uh, issue to a town council workshop um, and that we at that time also invite uh, the stakeholders on this issue to, to please attend and also ask the <coughs> town staff who are familiar with the issue including the police chief to also attend. Uh, by making this motion I'm not indicating preference that we do one thing or the other. I just feel that we need to learn more about the issue. We've received a complaint or a concern from a member of uh, our, the public. And I think we have a duty to check into it. Second it. Further discussion? Jessica? I just had a question for Mr. Wagner. Um, in, I, you know, in reading your letter, um, do you, could you please let us know the citizens of Cape Elizabeth uh, that have retained you? Not at this moment. Okay. I have to check with my client, but I'm not authorized at this point. Jamie, is, is that because they're concerned about sort of, not retribution, that sounds like a strong word, but concerned that they they themselves might be the target of some sort of animosity? Uh, David, I wouldn't want to put words in their mouth. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to consult with them and, and get back to the council on that point. But Jim? Just to, I'm, we've got it first, we have it seconded here, so is there another, another approach to this than to go to a, uh, to, to go to, to a workshop? There was an offer on the part of the gun club to sit down and talk. I understand from the previous attempts that Councilor Wagner tried and didn't get a response. So I wonder, is there another approach that could be used here where they could be encouraged to sit down and try to work these things out uh, prior to going to a workshop with us? Um, I, you know, again, just as an alternative to what's being presented here as, a, as the next step. And even at that level, you know, there are seven of us, maybe one of us or two, whatever, it would have to be less than three in order to keep it from being a public meeting, actually participate in that discussion between Council Wagner and the gun club. And I just offer that as an alternative, that's all. Um, I, so you give it three months or you give it four months, whatever you do, and then it comes back to us and goes to a workshop and then obviously through whatever process we wish to have. But I, my, I just put it on the table as a suggestion, that's all. I think my preference would be to, to follow what the recommendation is here and go to a workshop so that I agree that subsequent conversations should happen between the key players here. But I think it would be helpful for them to start with us in a workshop so they have a direction to go in and we are sort of kept abreast of what it is. And it doesn't have to be a whole workshop, it could just be a portion of one, but I guess I'm in favor of having it come before us in a public meeting and having all interested people come and discuss it, particularly given what appears to be a difficult uh, history of the two of them sort of getting together in any cooperative way. It's just my opinion. I, yeah, think, I, mean, we should, I think we should go to a workshop. Yeah, I mean, in, in a, I, I, I agree with you that that's certainly a, a, I was trying to, to, to ride on the concept that has been presented here by the president of the club which is that he's willing to sit down and talk. I, you know, again, whether it's with us at the council level or whether it's independent of us at this, this juncture, you know, I'm just looking at alternatives to come up with a solution. If the goal here is to coexist in this neighborhood, um, you know, I'm all for taking whatever steps that, that, that's necessary to get that to happen. And if that's back to workshop, fine. But um, I'm also willing to give my time and, uh, 
to this if, uh, if the council wished to have us sit in a meeting where they try to get together. So. Yeah, I was going to suggest, I'm supportive of Jim's approach, but, but I also have heard the council say they want to get up to speed on it. But you know, the, the difficulty is I don't know if the council wants to spend workshop after workshop getting into the details of, of this issue. So you know, maybe the compromise is the council has an initial meeting and you know, where they do have a workshop that everyone hears what the issues are, begins to understand them, and then an encouragement for a certain period of time for the, the main parties involved to go and have discussions with the understanding the council is going to revisit it at a set date. I, that's fine. It might I think be that's more accommodating to try to solve a difficult issue. I think that's a good idea. Oh. Um, we've sort of closed out the public comment. I apologize. Um, Okay, so the motion is that we send it to a workshop. I think that's a good idea. It doesn't have to be multiple workshops. It doesn't even have to be a whole workshop. It's just enough to get all of us on the same page. And then, as you say, Jim, if we want to assign one or two counselors and a few of uh, the uh, necessary townspeople and whoever the two sides of this want to choose to further have further meetings, I think that's a good idea. And ultimately, it'll probably come back to the council. So should we vote on the motion that's on the table? Jessica? Oh, does the gun club have legal representation? I'm sorry? Does the gun club have legal representation? There are citizens that apparently do, but... Well, um, what, what about the, the, the attorneys representing the parties meeting? If they haven't, wouldn't they meet? And um, given now that this issue has come before the council, wouldn't there be incentive to discuss things on their own? So maybe we could just offer a timeline of six months or something, please, and then revisit the issue at that point? Dave? Uh, I don't think anything we're doing in setting a workshop forecloses the attorneys from speaking with each other or the stakeholders from speaking with each other. And if that happens and then they reach some kind of solution before a workshop, well, great and we can hear about it at the workshop, but I feel like this issue has been around long enough that we ought to just move it forward. A concern has been raised. Let's just have the workshop, and then we'll have, be in a much better position to decide what appropriate steps might be if there are any additional steps to take. I agree with that. Should we vote? One more comment. The uh, gun club has, has indicated, Mr. Mann has indicated that the paramount concern is safety. Mr. Wagner has indicated that his focus is safety. We're both on the same page in terms of what they're trying to accomplish. So I think in coming to the workshop, it'd be, I think it would be very productive if both sides had specific recommendations as to what they think can occur which would promote safety. I think debating the facts is not necessarily going to be very productive. But if they have new and different ideas about how everyone can be satisfied with the safety of the club, that's the most important element of the, the outcome that could come from the workshop. Uh, okay. All those in favor? Thank you, and thank you very much for everyone who came out this evening. No, no, we're just letting people clear. <laughs> oh, we'll probably take another half hour. Okay, moving along. Uh, item 61, 2012. This is, should I ask them to? You're piling out still.
This is uh, item 61, 2012. This is the library project public engagement process. Um, essentially, this is asking us to consider the proposed um, schedule and also uh, specific tasks that would that would be involved in, in engaging the public and, in, and, and educating the public before we take our vote in October. So why don't we have a motion then a discussion? Jessica? I propose that we accept. I'm sorry. Public comments first. I'm sorry. Okay. Public comments first. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Philip Kaminsky, <laughs> resident of Cape Elizabeth. It's our concern that Cape Elizabeth Town Council and Town Manager, by their desire to circumvent a referendum on the library budget and its planning, are not being ethically responsible to the voters. The entire voting public of Cape Elizabeth should have the right, through our votes, to decide on a new library and what the voters are willing to pay for its planning, design, construction, bond interest, and future maintenance. We do this for all other educational facilities in Cape. The library should not be the exception. <clears throat> to me, it is uncon unconscionable to think that the council and town manager want to circumvent representative government in this way. This may constitute a lack of fiduciary responsibility on the part of town council. Town manager Mike McGovern's schedule for the public informational meetings, ending with a vote by the council in October, is too long, carries on beyond September, and eliminates the possibility for citizens to place a library referendum on this November's ballot. The schedule should be shortened to allow sufficient time for citizens to get the referendum on this November's ballot. Or the council should place a referendum on the ballot and allow the entire town to decide what we want. Let Cape vote by referendum for or against the library and the library budget in an open and transparent manner. In my opinion, from research, there's clear conflicts of interest in the way that this happened, that there are lapses in fiduciary duty uh, from an ethical and legal standpoint, um, and these have occurred. The council, on its own, voted on February 13th to accept their own goals, one of which was to schedule a citizen vote, a referendum, on the library. Then apparently, <laughs> they decided in March that citizens didn't need to vote on a large bond issue and a library plan, and have gone forward with the idea that a majority, a narrow majority of town council can determine that a very large project, like this library project, and the eight and a half million dollar budget is only part of it. It's only the construction. Um, so that you may see over the 20 year life of this bond issue that it's actually double and it may be two and a half times as much. I know this because I've worked on multiple, multiple referendums and bond issues throughout the state of Maine and other states. In fact, I was part of I'm the sorry, team. I'm sorry, there's a three minute limit. So. I asked the council for more time since allowed, and I'd like to point out that the last issue was given 45 minutes of public comment. I know I'm just saying technically everyone gets three minutes, so I'm just saying sort well, of start wrapping um, up. That's why I may, <laughs> may have more time. You may have one more minute. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'll be direct. I'd like the town council to vote here, to make a motion and to vote, which they can do, to hold a referendum and to hold that referendum either in November 
and educate the public the way we do in normal referendums, or to push it back to June 13th, which was the original date that the library committee, the town council, and your consultants had set up for a referendum by the full town. I really think this needs to be open to the light of day, transparent, and that all the voters for or against should look at what they want for a library, what they want to pay, and do this right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mary Kiernan, 1 Wentworth Road. I would encourage the council to send the question about the library construction to a referendum on the November 2012 ballot. Such a citizen vote was listed in the goals of the town council as follows, quote, in 2012, the town council will schedule a citizen vote on a new vision and facility for the Thomas Memorial Library and Cultural Center, end quote. I respect the council manager form of government and believe that representative uh, form of government is the best for our town, for day-to-day -day operations, and for other important work. <clears throat> However, I believe that decisions on multi-year, multi-million dollar capital expenditures should not be made by only four or even seven people. This project would ramp up the town's ongoing operations and maintenance costs for years to come, and I believe that people of the town have the right to say whether they want to pay for these costs during what is a very difficult and uncertain economic time. I ask the council to stick with its original inclination and put this item to a referendum on the November ballot when we all anticipate a high voter turnout due to the presidential election. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. So, council discussion. Have we had a motion? Oh, I, need a, I think I need a motion. Motion first, right? Motion. Yep. Uh, I move that we uh, consider the proposed library public engagement process as um, put forth by the town manager. Well, is it appropriate to ask a question of, of the motion maker before I second this? Are you, sure. Are you asking to consider or to approve? To, wait a minute, when did I read this? It says consider, do we even need a motion? Indeed. It, if I'll answer your question. <laughs> the, the agenda item says the town council will consider a proposed Thomas Memorial so Library public yeah, engagement yeah. process. No, it intends that there'll be a motion made d depending on what motion the council wishes to make. So maybe we should have a discussion okay. before we make a motion because we don't really know what we're making a motion for. Like I think the, 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 the citizen oh. comment deserves some discussion. Well, so, Madam she, Chair, I'm, I'm willing to restate my motion. Okay, fire away. I move that we accept the public engagement process proposed by the town manager. If that's more clear. I'll, I'll second that motion. Okay. Discussion. There. <laughs> um, I just, in defense or whatever of the town manager, uh, I, I just want people in the public to understand that he and the town chair actually prepared this public engagement process at the request of a majority of the members of the town council during our workshop. It wasn't as if this was his grand master plan to try to uh, disenfranchise members of the public from the process. This was the direction that four of the seven members of the council wanted to go in. And so he and the chair, who frankly disagreed with this approach, came up with a t uh, essentially a timeline to determine how we might uh, end up voting on the, the library project. Uh, and in addition to the ti on the timing issue, uh, one of the issues that we discussed was uh, whether uh, this should occur earlier or later 
And one thought that we had, frankly, was that people who might oppose this project to the extent the town council voted in favor of the library at an October meeting, they might be able to use the general election, uh, which will obviously generate a lot of interest because it's a presidential election to gather the necessary signatures if they wanted to essentially recall that vote. So it really wasn't an effort uh, to try to somehow sneak this through and make it impossible for, for opponents to do anything about it. It was actually the contrary. But I, I just wanted to put that out there because there's at least Mr. Kaminsky's comments seem to imply that this was the town manager uh, trying to pull a fast one, and, and that's, just, that's just completely inaccurate and unfair. He did. Should I be able to respond to Yeah, can you just respond from there? Sure. Can't be heard. Um, he's got to go to the mic, too. Go to the mic. Sorry, you've got to come up to the mic. <clears throat> Regardless of how the town manager was directed to come up with the schedule, the point is that the schedule precludes citizens from getting on this ballot. In the referendum pro process, you can speed that up. You can have an education process prior to the election. Um, and you, it, typically, the educational process is done prior to a, a referendum. However, in the, pro in the processes that I've been involved in, we've been able to do it in a much shorter time frame. It means that your consultants that you've hired have to work a little quicker, pull together what they have. Uh, apparently you have uh, cost figures um, because you've come up with some numbers, so it ought to be easy enough to look at the interest rates over 20 years, identify through your consultants the operation and maintenance, look at how many employees are going to be needed to hire and what their costs would be to the town, and so you would have the budget uh, numbers uh, to put forward. And so that would be a fairly short period of time. But to stretch it out beyond September for an October vote by the council precludes the citizens from actually being able to do what you say is use the November election to get signatures and, and come to a referendum vote. So we're, I think we're going to have that conversation. Thank you. And we're about to have that conversation, I think, because you're right, it has to do with the schedule. So thank you. Trank. May I ask a question, Mr. Kaminsky? Sorry. <laughs> Since you're standing here, I'll ask a question. I happen to believe we should have a referendum, and I voted uh, in support of a referendum, put it that way. And, uh, or it wasn't really a vote, it was a discussion in our workshop. Uh, but I'd be curious as to, I guess, two things I'd like to say. First of all, I agree 100% with what David said. And secondly, I, I, don't, I don't know what you're using to suggest that there's an ethical or um, fiduciary lapse here. Um, even though I disagree with the majority, I didn't see that occur either. The question I want to ask you is this. Uh, in supporting a referendum for any topic, what would you see as the threshold for those items which should go to referendum versus those which should not? Because versus, cer certainly everything can't go to referendum. Well, in terms of a price. Uh, okay. Well, whatever okay. it is. What's let's, the threshold? let's talk about the history in Cape. No, no, for, we don't have time. Just to, I think he's just asking for what. Well, I'm answering the question. Okay. The, um, the walkway along Shore Drive was, I think, a $750,000 item on a $1.5 million budget, and that went to referendum. Uh, that's I understand. Actually, that's I'm, actually not true. It's not true. It didn't go there. It didn't go to referendum. It went to a, a citizen vote. It did not. Non-binding. It no. did not. No. Nope. The okay. How much should it be? I personally, I think that anything that goes beyond the normal budget year, where it's a multi-year budget for multi millions of dollars, should go to referendum. Uh, and clearly, eight and a half million, that's half of what was spent on a high school, I believe. It's a major uh, school addition. Uh, it's larger uh, than the police and fire uh, project, either one. Um, and I understand that the police and fire was part of the, the background for this, but that was post 9-11, and that was considered a public safety issue. This is not a public safety issue, and it's a huge amount of money. Nobody can tell me, because I, I understand the numbers. It's, it's not $8.5 million that's going to be spent over 20 years. It's going to be two and a half times that, and then it's going to be spent for the rest of the life of the town. And I'm not saying 
I don't stand here as being for or against it at this point. Um, I'm not making a case that it shouldn't be done. I'm not making a case that it should be done. My case is that as a citizen of the town, as an American citizen, I do not want my vote taken away from me. It's the most important thing in my life, next to my family and my country. I do not want my vote taken away. Thank you. Thank you. So, discussion? I, I actually have a, a, a question. Um, Sir? Yeah. Just, I know we all have stated our positions on whether it should be a referendum or the town council voting, but Mr. Kaminsky has raised an interesting point in that should, the, should it be a quicker schedule? And if I recall the discussion at the workshop, we were, some of us were concerned that if we ended up doing this in June or July, there right. might not be an opportunity for us to get much public comment due to the fact that school, the school year would have just ended. We might lose a lot of citizens in that sort of public engagement process. So that was really the genesis, I think, of, of Right. pushing this out to October. I frankly in the beginning was thinking, can't we do this quicker? Which is sort of ironic because although I disagree with Mr. Kaminsky on whether there ought to be a referendum, I initially agreed with his position that this could occur more quickly. But again, the effort was to make sure that we were adequately engaging the public in the process. And that's why we really looked to the October vote. So I'm still fine with this schedule, but but I'm open to hearing what others in the council have that to say was, about that. That was, my, that was going to be my question, because my question is this. If we vote to borrow this money and a citizen um, has enough problem with that, either the vote itself that we're spending the money or the fact that we took away the citizen's vote, um, and I frankly think there are going to be citizens out there, I've actually spoken to some, that they go out and they get 700 signatures, then, I do, then would it not be beneficial to have that happen in time for the, for the vote? It then becomes incumbent upon us to put it out to a town-wide vote. Would it not make sense for that vote to be in the November when everyone's showing up? So in other words, that would be an argument to make the schedule go faster so that in the event that we end up with a referendum, whether we want it or not, it can happen in November rather than in January or something when no one's paying attention. So let me just ask a question. So if, if, the, if we voted in June, whatever time frame, or, or, or day, September. whatever, and there was a citizen uh, petition for repeal, <clears throat> what would, is that what it would be, a repeal? Well, they petition and force it to go to a vote. Well, I'm not sure. Is it something that forces it to go to a vote, or it's simply repeal town council action? Do you want me to? Please. Yeah, it, it, as you look at schedule, you know, let me present the schedule as if there was a citizen vote. Uh, you need to start, if the citizens wanted to vote on this in November and they wanted to do it by form of a petition, if you look at the charter requirements, uh, first of all, the absentee ballots need to be available at least 30 days prior to the vote. So that brings you back to October 2nd. Uh, before that, you have a requirement that before you set it out to a vote, you, you have to have a public hearing again and an opportunity. That elapses about 15 to 30 days, so let's say September 2nd, uh, or, or the first week of September. You, you then I'm sorry, have, I missed you on that logic. Why would it be a month that we would need a month before? Because under, un, within the charter, there's a provision that you have to set it out to a vote and that you, you have to have a public hearing once the petition comes in before you schedule the vote. That's in the charter. So why would that have to be a month before? Why couldn't it be late September? Uh, it could be... It needs to be in September. Okay. The, once the council votes, the citizens have up to 30 days to collect signatures to override a council vote. They could take less time than that and start the process earlier, but the process does allow up to 30 days. That brings you back to needing to vote in August, which is what you were trying to avoid because there's no air conditioning here and, and a lot of people <laughs> take off during the summer. So that was the thinking and of the later dates in part. But that would be that would be the challenge. I should say that would be the challenge if you look toward 
giving citizens an, an opportunity to petition it in time for a November vote. So, Jim? Sir, setting aside the presidential election, which we've all had a conversation that the fact that all, you know, all 9,000 people in town will be coming to that event. So say we did make the decision in October and we go through the process from there, you're talking about a special election when? January? February? The council would have the right to set a specific date for that election. So, so the citizen gets the, the right to vote on it regardless, setting aside the presidential election. So nobody's really, I don't believe anybody's dis disenfranchised by the current plan that's in front of us with a date of October 10th because regardless they still have the right to petition us or petition get 700 signatures and get it on a ballot so so I, you know it seems to me like this presidential election seems to be this arbitrary goal line that we've got out there which I frankly certainly would like to have as much input from citizens when they take a vote but at the same token, I don't feel that they wouldn't be able to go forward with what the process is in the Charter anyway, and it would just mean we'd have a special election. We would. I think the concern, people's concern, is that it doesn't, it never draws the same number of people because people are human beings and they don't make time, and that, and that, that they're all going to be there in November, and so it feels like you're getting the opinion of more people. There's another five or $6,000 for an election. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? 6000 David, and then Jessica. Well, my, and this is a question for the town manager, if that's okay. Let's just assume that there's an effort to do the, this petition, and let's just assume we want to uh, uh, have orchestrate this so that, that the vote on that petition by the townspeople would occur at the November election. How far back, and you've probably already answered this, but when would this council need to vote on the library project? Let, let me go is back. The, and, uh, is it the August meeting or is it the July meeting? I was reading the charter provisions from memory. Right. Let, me, let me actually read the, uh, the, the uh, piece. All ordinances or any vote for a single capital expenditure or a single capital expenditure to the total cost of which exceeds 0.05% of the last state valuation. Base, basically anything over about 800,000, shall be subject to overrule by a referendum as hereafter provided, except the following shall not be subject to referendum, the budget, emergency ordinances passed pursuant to uh, petition for enactment. But what the, what the dates are, if we then, it's, this is 20 days in this provision, 20 days after the enact, enactment of any such ordinances or passage of any such vote, a petition signed by not less than 10% of the registered voters of the town of Cape Elizabeth is filed with the clerk requesting its reference to a referendum. The council shall call a public hearing to be held within 30 days from the date of the filing of said petition with the town clerk. So first you call a public hearing within 30 days and shall within 14 days after said public hearing designate a time and place for the purpose of submitting to a referendum vote the question of adopting such ordinance or approving such vote. Uh, and that, that does not say that the vote's within 14 days. That says you set it within the next 14 days. So, you know, you can look at those different dates and, you know, you can calculate accordingly uh, the timetable. So the, at August. the August meeting falls on what day? It would, if it was like a typical schedule, it would be the second Monday so of say, August. Let's say it's August 10th. Um, uh, then the people who want to do some sort of recall petition have the month of August to gather 20 signatures. They have 20 they, days they from 20 August days. 13th. So let's just say they take about 20 days and they present that to the council in early September. Uh, we then um, have to schedule a public hearing within 30 days, so presumably we could do that in a shorter window. Does the hearing have to occur within 30 days, or you have to set the date in 30 days? So the, we, we have to hold a public hearing within hold 30 it. days, Yeah, right? Hold it. That's right. So let's just say we got the uh, signed petition with the 700 signatures in early September. Conceivably, we have a public hearing within 10 days to allow an opportunity to advertise, et cetera. Yeah. 
you, you need a little time there for the clerk to make sure the petitions are valid. And uh, so yeah. two weeks. I'm just trying. All right, so that gets us to mid to late September. Yeah. Uh, to have that public hearing. Yeah, then you're too late. Uh, and then, oh, right. Then we're we've missed the absentee deadline, so we're really. Thank you. So we really would have to do this vote in July on the library to, to make it possible. Caitlin, Thanks, Caitlin. And Jess, <laughs> as, as someone who was in favor for the referendum as well, I think it should be an eye-opening concern that our discussion is based about the fact that we think most people are going to want to call and repeal this when maybe we should just be rethinking and sending this to referendum in the first place. I mean, my feeling is it's a little bit like the threat of a filibuster. It, it already it changes. It's already a game changer because it's the presence of it has altered. You know what I mean. But anyway, Jessica, go ahead. Yeah, uh, a couple points um, to address some of the, the public comment we just heard, and also for the benefit of our reader, our uh, wat, uh, people watching at home. Um, first of all, town council guidelines are, are guidelines. They're not uh, voted achievements that must be that must occur. They're guidelines, and certainly since I've been on the council, there are guidelines, uh, goals, I mean, that ha there are go goals that have not been achieved, and they can be changed, depending, but they are, they're goals, but they're guidelines. Um, just for the benefit of some who may not realize this, the school um, uh, issues are mandated to go to, uh, to go to referendum by state law. So that, that's state law, that's not, uh, you know, a choice per se. Um, citizens can petition if they don't like any vote of the council. This is not this is not a new thing. This could happen at any time that people decide they they don't like the council direction. Um, the um, library, just to just to you know, remind people, and I won't say too much because there has been so much said, has been in the public eye since the first studies started to occur in 2007. There have been public hearings, there have been multiple public workshops, 500 mem member surveys, 300 member surveys. This is, this is an issue that has been out in the public eye. There's every, every bit of information is on the website. So I, I just do hope that everyone realizes this, this is, has been an extremely transparent process. Um, and so I would like to make that point. Um, and that's all. <laughs> so uh, Sarah. Jim and then Dave. Okay. So if, if what we've just determined um, is that uh, we need to modify this, this plan. So you've made the, the original the other one who, who proposed it and was seconded, we need to modify the original uh, proposal to a vote in July or August, whatever we're working against here. Um, because um, it just seems to me that we're trying to accommodate the eventuality here, but at the, at the same token, I mean, are we going to modify this, this, what we're considering voting here, or are we going to go forward with it and just take it with a seven vote? I mean, I. I'm just asking whether or not we're going to, what, what we're, we should be talking about here. Are we talking about a modified version based upon what the manager has indicated for getting it to a referendum? Or, I, I mean, I'm a little confused as to what we're, what we're dealing with right now. Because what's on the table, it probably should be voted up or down or something. <laughs> I'm just wondering where we're going. David. It's sort of the, like the tail wagging the dog. I, I haven't really focused as much on the overarching issue. Uh, I believe the town council should vote on this. We have a representative form of government, so I respectfully disagree with the comments tonight. Uh, and I think that the original schedule ought to just, uh, I, I would not be prepared to amend the, the schedule as proposed. I think, frankly, for those people who may end up opposing this project, this schedule actually makes it easier for them to gather the necessary signatures within the required time frame. That's fine. Whatever happens with that, we can't predict. But I, I, I think we came up with the schedule for a reason, and that was to allow there to be an opportunity for public comment, public feedback, and for us to make the best decision possible. So I, 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 I know that not everybody in the council agrees that we should decide the issue, but I think everybody agreed there ought to be adequate time to vet the issue. So I think the schedule makes more sense than trying to do the exercise of what we just did. Okay. I think it just feels too rushed. Yeah. Frank? I'm wondering, um, I, I really don't know the answer to this question, but if we were to hold a vote in July, what are the implications for what we would have to do between now and then? So we have something really to 
some substance to discuss why, why it would be or would not be a good idea to do it in July. What, what would we have to accomplish in the next four months? What we have left? Uh, Madam Chair, I've got a couple of things that might actually sort of direct into uh, Frank's question. Um, the, we, we came up with this plan uh, you know, in our discussions, and um, Chairman Lennon and the town manager put this plan together as a result of the consensus discussion at the workshops. And part of that was to further the public education and outreach. Um, and so I initially was in favor of, of voting, as you all know, um, earlier. But then I, I went along with the idea that, well, okay, even though this has been studied since 2007, a few more months is okay. And as a result of that, we have tasked the Board of Trustees, as well as the Foundation, with work. The Board of Trustees of the Thomas Morrill Library had a special meeting last week, which I attended. And they have a schedule. They have set a schedule for public education and outreach. Um, and uh, involving the very uh, uh, the, ver the various um, entities that we actually discussed, um, such as uh, school groups and so forth, parent associations and other entities in town. So, so what I'm saying goes along with uh, Councillor Sherman and you know uh, what uh, Councillor um, Governelli is saying because we we have set this up. We've asked the the people, the tr uh, the trustees and the foundation to proceed. They are doing that. So if we change this schedule yet again, you know we're, we are, we have other other people to consider. Okay. Just a quick question. Mike uh, and Dave commented that we set it for the October meeting so that we would have the time or the opportunity to use the election day to collect signatures if somebody wanted to do that. My question is, is we previously thought it was 30 days to collect signatures. Yeah. Now it's 20. Is it 20 business days or 20 calendar days? It's calendar days. So from a vote on October 10th, 20 days from that is October you start on the 11th, so October 31st, so you would not have the election day to collect signatures. Just. Yeah, the election's late this year, too. It's not till November 6th. So... You push back the meeting. Sounds like... To accommodate that. Yeah, I mean, you could move the meeting to later in October, so they have the 20 days. Well, I'm not sure whether it's germane, whether they need it or not. I think if someone's passionate enough, it's pretty easy to get 700 signatures. You Xerox the thing and hand it to five other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess we're sounding, the consensus is sounding as though we're going to go ahead with this. I just like, I just like, personally, I feel that this, it's, it's quite possible this is going to have the ironic outcome <laughs> of, of, of voting down the library for the wrong reason, because I think many people will sign the petition, therefore they will be educated that they're angry about not being able to vote, not about the library. They will turn out at least 700 and maybe one, the best friend of each of those 1,400 people, turn out to say no to the library, not because they don't want a library, but because they're, they didn't get to vote and therefore, in other words, by having a special election, I think you, you run the risk of having more people opposed to the project than if you just had it with the whole town wide, where I personally think it would pass and I hope it passes. So I'm just, that's just a fear of mine, that paradoxically we're going to end up with the exact opposite thing we had hoped for by keeping it from going to referendum. But I guess I've already expressed that. So it's just a risk I think we're taking. Because not everyone's going to show up at this special election. It's only going to be the people who are passionately for it, passionately against it, or who are angry that they didn't get to vote. So anyway, we've already talked about all this. So should we just march ahead with Kathy? Um, one of the things that I noticed that when Mike was talking was that the special election just has to be set by the town council, but it doesn't have to be in January. It could be at the next, I mean, I'm not saying we're trying to postpone anything additional, but it could be at the next major election, which may be June of next year, or? The council has the flexibility to set the date of the election. It could be so school it, budget. It, yeah, it could be another time when there's, I mean, if that, if that occurs, that's a, a piece that I, didn't hear us discuss, but mm -hmm. we don't have to have a special election in January. We could, we have to set it at a, within a certain time frame, but we could have it at another major time. Um, so just that is a possible 
thought. Yeah, that's a good point. Frank? I, I guess I would just, um, I think for the benefit of those people who support the library, the, uh, it seems to me there's strong enough support against or for the referendum and therefore, in a sense, against the library, that if we wait for a vote till next June on this library, um, that seems to me to be pushing back library plans awfully far. And would you want to reconsider, I mean, given this possibility, would you want to reconsider the uh, benefit <coughs> of doing this in July? I mean, what's, I mean, it's basically a trade-off. If, if you think the prospect of a repeal is real, then the, um, you either have the op option of pushing the vote more rapidly in July, in a few months, or potentially waiting until next June. And, you know, Jessica, your point that mm -hmm. there are people who have done a lot of work on this already and be pushing it, uh, granted, but if they have to wait till next June, that's a big deal. And with a new you, countdown, I'm sorry, what, it's wait. a big deal, I mean, to what, wait what, a whole another year. Oh, oh right. Yeah. I and you'll you have a new town yeah. council as well. Um, and I, you know, we're having a lot of discussion about this, and I know we've received a few letters from people, but I do not have a sense that there is an overwhelming group of people that want to sign a petition. Um, and I know when I was on the school board, we had a lot of um, these types of situations where a few people who are upset with something present that they're upset, um, and that's fine, um, but sometimes they present as if they represent a large group of people. And I think it's sometimes easy to, because there's discussion, because we're having a discussion here, that there's a sense that there's an, an overwhelming group of people that want it to go to referendum, and I personally don't see that yet. Um, I'm not saying it's not there. I'm not saying it is there. I'm just saying that I personally don't see it. So I just wanted to make that point. Yeah. And it's all part of the process. When we get public feedback, we're going to start hearing from people whether they are for or against the library project, uh, whether they think it ought to look like something different, whether they think the budget ought to be different. And also, we may hear from people about this notion that, boy, council, you really should be setting this out to a referendum. Um, uh, as a philosophical matter, I think it's the town council's job to vote on issues that come before it, whether they're controversial, expensive, you name it. Every controversial issue that has come before the council since I've been on it, the people who don't necessarily like the direction the council's going in say, this really ought to go to a referendum. We had a gentleman run for the council a few years ago. His platform was basically every issue should go to a referendum. He did not garner many votes. Uh, we, as a council, have a duty to decide issues. We also have a duty to listen to the public, and we have a duty to gather information. And although there appears to be uh, a, a majority of the council right now that conceptually favor the library moving forward, we don't know what that vote's going to be come October or whenever we hold this vote. Uh, so I, I'm happy to speed it along. Frank, I'm, I'm happy not to. I, I just think that the, uh, the idea was we wanted to ensure there was an adequate opportunity for us to hear from the public. So even though originally, like Jessica, I thought July would be fine or June would be fine, I, I think it makes sense to wait. And we really can't predict what type of reaction we'll get once there's a vote, because we frankly don't know what the vote's going to be. OK, so are we ready to vote on this? Um... I, I guess one outcome is when we start hearing from the public and having these open meetings, if every single person is saying, we're mad at you because you're not putting it to a vote, we can change our mind again, right? I mean, if you that's, hear that from 99% well, of the people who show up, that's going to alter our vote. I presume we'll decide to do that or change what we're looking at. So you're right. There's still, a, there's still time for the process to, to work in terms of citizens telling us what they want. So why don't we vote on the motion, which is that we accept this document as we have it, and that we we start on the road of, of <clears throat> proceeding this way. Is that everyone prepared to vote on that? Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. That was a good discussion. Thank you to those who came to speak. Um, where are we here? Okay, item 62, 2012. Jim, do you want to give us a little background on this? Um, you uh, had um, the presentation that was made by um, 
Jessica Sullivan, um, representing the um, Conservation Committee, uh, brought to an ordinance a new chapter for the management of open space. And uh, the um, council um, asked us to look at it. We spent a couple of meetings doing so. Um, we invited, as part of a new process that was suggested by uh, Caitlin Jordan, we invited interested and uh, constituents in that subject matter to come and speak to us. Uh, and uh, what you have in front of you is, um, is a proposed new chapter to conservation ordinance that should be sent to public hearing on May 14th, 2012. Very pleased with the result of that, and I think we've learned uh, from other work that we've done at Fort Williams and other places in the community, we've been able to adopt a lot of uh, consistency across uh, the methodology that we've used in the ordinance. It's very good work. So I move that we go to public hearing on May 14, 2012. I, I second the motion. Discussion? Hmm. Yep. I just wanted to thank the ordinance committee and just to point out, um, just review with Council Walsh while this is in front of you all, really, uh, if, you, if you would just, Jim, just highlight what the change was. It was really having to do with uh, event size and so forth that we added, isn't that? Well, you've got a... Similar to... Um, um, the way that the Fort Williams right. deals with, with events. Right. Um, we've also put in place a process for approval for using any of, the, um, any of this... Uh, these town lands um, that's much more, um, shall we say, um, transparent to anyone who mm -hmm. wishes to use it. We've um, placed the town manager in the process. It's very clear who one needs to get approval from to, to have an event or whatever in any one of the um, you know, trail networks that we have in town. So it's a, it's a fairly simple process, but one that I think we've been very uh, clear about and uh, and again, using a page from the Fort Williams um, in terms of open space and, and their group use policy. So, Yep, and the Conservation Commission is very comfortable with this. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for the work. Um, any other comments? All those in favor? Uh, item 63, 2012 request from the Ordinance Committee. Jim, again. Again, um, a couple of meetings ago, we dealt with a setback boundary issue with, uh, with a resident in town. Uh, in looking at this, not that the Ordinance Committee needs to go out and look for work. Um, <laughs> we certainly get our share of it. Uh, but felt that, um, that, that it, it, you know, so when you don't have a problem, maybe that's a time to go back and sort of rethink what we're doing. And the thought was to go back and look at um, whether in fact we ought to be um, expecting boundary surveys as part of an application for an, a, a modification or addition to a home. Um, so as to be absolutely 100% sure that where they're placing this new addition, if in fact there is one, it's, it's on their property and the setbacks are all correct and so forth. It's just, you know, there are Class D surveys all over the place which are done just simply for the financing and the mortgage component of a, of a sale, and they tend not to be accurate. And in this case, we wound up with something that only surfaced as a result of the sale of the home, and because it wasn't properly researched in the first place, it held up the sale of the house. And what we, we're looking at here is a little more of an offensive approach. And um, again, we have no real uh, answer to the question, but we'd like permission from the town council to go forward with a, with a little bit of research and come back with a recommendation. Is that a motion? Uh-huh. I'll second that. Discussion? Sorry. I, 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 I started looking at the paper, and I wasn't listening, so I apologize. I didn't mean Dave, uh, to be critical. No, I was, I, I was wondering the same thing. I'm like, can that pass as a motion? Since you believe in representative government, I'd like to. It was a long, it was a long <laughs> motion. Um, well, thank you for, for being preemptive and going out there and beating the bushes for more work. We like, we, we like that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm going to vote against this motion. No. <laughs> All right, 700 <laughs> signatures will get reversed. <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Jim, you have to vote for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to vote. <laughs> Item 64, 2012, Appointment Committee Recommendation. Jessica is the chair of the Appointments Committee. Yes, um, 
uh, Councilors Jordan and Governelli and I met and interviewed applicants. Our, our uh, recommendation to the Council is Jennifer Taranjo. Um, and again, we are always, as always, so incredibly fortunate in Cape Elizabeth to have outstanding applicants. It's always a difficult decision. But we uh, put forth uh, her name and uh, hope that she wins, that she will be voted in. Okay, is that a, is that a motion? Yes, that's a motion. <laughs> <laughs> is there a second? Second. All those in favor? I would like to add, though, Sarah, that as Jessica said, the um, applicant pool was phenomenal. <laughs> and I do hope that these folks stick around and try to uh, participate in other aspects of what we're doing, because they are really valuable people with really good resources. It's a very difficult decision. Finally, item 65, 2012, Town Computer Network Backup Server. Mike, do you want to talk about this at all? Yes, uh, you, you have a long description here prepared by Matthew Young, who works uh, with Gary Lenoy and also prepared by Gary on the issue we had with our network storage device uh, back a month or so ago. It, it, it ended up that we couldn't get access to any of our files for about 12 days, uh, not only here at the town hall, but also at the library uh, at Public Works. And if, uh, if you can just imagine the way that strangles you to be able to do that. And they have these complicated graphs and diagrams of, of <laughs> don't ask me to explain that. Uh, but what I can tell you is that the estimated cost uh, is, uh, is about $26,000. And I would prefer that we not wait to do this. Uh, uh, we, we've, seen, we've seen what happens when it, when it goes down and uh, strongly encourage you to assign uh, $26,000 towards replacement of uh, the storage, uh, network storage uh, device. Frank? Mike, that includes labor for installation and software? It, software. Yeah, it's, uh, All cost. it's complete. Uh, is there a motion? Kathy? I move that we um, allow the town manager to assign $26,000 from the general fund um, for the purpose of a town computer network backup server. Seconded. Discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Uh, we have a second opportunity for citizens um, for discussion of the items that were not on the agenda. Is anyone here to talk about anything? Okay. So I guess I need a motion for adjournment. So moved. Executive session. Oh. I'm sorry about that. We're going to go into executive session. Um, to consider a poverty abatement, and then we will come back to adjourn. So I guess I need a motion to go into executive session. Sure, I would move that in conformance with Title I of the Maine Revised Statute, Section 4056F, that we enter into executive session to review an application for hardship abatement, and also pursuant to Section 4056D, that we go into executive session uh, to review with the town manager the status of a successor agreement with, with Local 340 of the Teamsters representing Public Works staff. Second. I second the motion. All those in favor? Thank you. Excuse me, Chair. It just it seems like we're still in the air at this point. We are we going off air? We're going off we're going air. Going to the yeah, right. And there will there will be a public vote just on the right. the hardship abatement issue, not on the other. But okay. Usually, folks don't bother to stick around for it unless they choose to. <laughs> Thank you. We're all set. Yep.